What's going on everybody? It's Max here and today we are tackling a video that I have talked about in the last four or five from our Solaris tutorial series and that is all of your questions about the game. I took a look at every single comment that's been left on all of the eight videos that we did in the tutorial series and I compiled that into a video here where we're going to talk about your frequently asked questions. What things did I not cover exactly or not really uh, delve into during the series, I can delve into today. So we're just gonna jump in with your first question and that is, what is the importance of specializing planets? This is a really, really, really good question because I didn't really explain why it was so important. It's kind of hard to show this in the early game. So what I'm gonna be showing you are some later game uh, saves that I have and show you a little bit about what those look like and why some of these elements are so important. So here we are with a bit of a mid game level. I think we're uh, 2300 in, so about a hundred years into the game. And I wanted to show you the specialization of planets that we've set up in this game specifically because we're playing as a really, really big tech focused empire. And if you take a look at Sutharia, this actually pr previously used to be our our capital system, our capital planet, but we've transferred it into a tech world. Now, I didn't explain too much in the tutorial series, but on the right side here, you can see that there's a colony designation. And this colony designation is something that typically is auto-generated, but you can override manually if you'd like to. And oftentimes you'll want to, because the game doesn't really quite understand what you're building towards, unless it's very, very obvious. In this case, I loaded this planet with a bunch of research labs, and so it became obvious through auto-designation that this was a tech world. And these designations actually give you a bonus for fulfilling certain types of gameplay or certain types of specializations. In this case, all of your research lab build speeds are reduced by 25%, which just makes them end up on the planet a little bit faster. But the big one is that every single researcher on this planet has their upkeep reduced by 20%. And that's only if this is a tech world. If I were to switch this to a refinery world for some strange reason, it would lose that 20% reduction on their upkeep. Remember, the upkeep of your um, of your researchers is located in the planet districts and upkeep section there. You can always hover over that to see what that is. So we are getting a massive reduction on every single one of our researchers. And the more researchers we have on this planet, the more of a benefit we get from the tech world specialization. Now. At this point, I'm going to actually lock this in because I know it's going to be a tech world forever. You might not necessarily want to lock in every single one of your specialties super early because sometimes they're the generic specialty, which I think is called the colony. Oh, you don't actually see it. I think once it gets to a certain size, if I take a look at a smaller planet like Hoshfir, this is, yeah, this is a colony designation. And it actually not only increases the happiness of your people on that planet, but it also increases amenities and stabilities. It is a really good early bonus for a planet that you don't quite know or don't quite have the buildings and the districts to specialize yet. Now, specialization goes towards your base resources as well. So in this case, we've got a generator world and the generator world, contrary to what we saw on our tech world, gives every single one of our technicians 25% increased output of energy. That's big. If you've got a massive, this isn't a massive generator world, but if you've got a massive generator world, that is a fantastic bonus on top of the bonuses you get from buildings like the energy grid. This is why specializing your planets is so important and so powerful in that way. Now, you won't always get that. I think I've got a planet in here. This one's actually a really great unification center, which is for bureaucrats, but I've got one in here that is sort of all over the place. I kind of made it an industrial world. I kind of gave it a little bit of mining districts. You'll notice that our minerals right now are a little bit in the dumps, and I'm trying to offset that a little bit. I added a hollow theaters and a luxury residences because Previously in the game, there were some issues with the amenities on this planet, and it has a natural moat harvesting location. So there's a moat harvesting traps on the planet as well. This is a bit of a jack of all trades, though it's certainly in the direction of an industrial planet. 
in these kind of cases, I would recommend you go into the, um, the settings here and manually choose whatever it is that you will get the most benefit out of, right? In this case, reducing the upkeep from artisans and metallurgists was the best thing for us. And that's the route we took. Specializing your planets has a big, big, big impact on your overall economy, but it can get a little bit scary if you start changing this frequently or you don't quite specialize in the right way. So definitely keep an eye on it, but don't freak out about it too much. It's certainly an intermediate to expert level strategy that you can employ in Solaris. Can you show us how to create our own faction? Absolutely. I think I may have even alluded to this in our first tutorial video where I said, hey, I'm going to skip the faction creation, but we'll get to it in the, in the next episode. And then we did seven episodes after that and I never came back to it. So let's take a look a little bit at faction creation. I won't go too in depth about this because there's a lot you can do, but I do think that it's good to give you a little bit of uh, preparation maybe so that you can build some of your own factions in the future. So we're here in the faction tab, and of course you can choose your appearance. I've got all the DLCs on, so you're gonna see some things possibly in my game that you don't have in yours. Uh, that would include stuff like the lithoids and the plantoids, the necroids, the aquatics. All of these are species packs that you can buy as DLCs for the game, and they unlock small uh, differences in your gameplay, different civics you can install, different traits you can have for your creatures. But outside of those, the ones that you start the game with, uh, outside of Machine also, which I think is its own DLC as well, you don't really necessarily care what your appearance is. All of these have exactly the same traits. It's only the DLC species that have specific traits to them. So machines have to have certain, uh, certain different gameplay styles that changes the way that you play the game. But if we're playing a humanoid race, I'm going to skip some of the more personal stuff like your species name uh, and your name lists. But let's come down to traits. Now, I have a pretty strong, uh, what would I call it, kind of philosophy around how I build my empires. I think there's there's really two or three different ways that you can build an empire in this game. If you want to just role play, you should think about what is your species? You know, what was their history? Where did they come from? Who really are they? And I think you can get some really great, fun, role-playing empires out of this. You can play a species that is subservient to another species, and they are trying to break out and take over the empire themselves. Or you can play a species that is just incredibly intelligent and really wants to focus on technology and nothing else at the expense of all else they just focus on tech there's a lot of different options there that's one way of doing it which is the role play way the other way of doing it is the min max way that is let's take a playthrough where we try to do everything the absolute best we possibly can and in some ways there's a little bit of overlap with the role playing way of this right you can come in here and say well i want to take the intelligent trait and not only that, because it gives me 10% increased uh, engineering research, I also want to take natural engineers. Now I'm getting 25% speed on the engineering research in the game. That's that's pretty big. You can do these kind of uh, min-maxi stacking traits and stacking civics on top of each other in ways that really boost one thing in the game and you go for a single thing. This might be a build where you go for the best ships or the best mega structures. If you've got the Utopia DLC, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. You could say instead, actually, I want to build a species that just focuses on making as much money as they possibly can. So you might take Ingenious, which gives you energy credit income, and Thrifty, which gives you trade income as well, trade value. And these two together are going to give you an empire that does a bunch, a bunch of income from, of energy credits from both trade and energy. And then if you come over to, of course, the origin section determines how you start the game and kind of your starting situation. So that that is something that you should consider. But the other big one is your government and your ethics. And you can stack these on top of that as well. So, for instance, if we're taking Thrifty and we are we are making sure that we are making a ton of uh, a ton of money off of trade value, then we probably also want to take Xenophilic, which gives us an 
additional increased trade value on top of that. So we can gain another 20% trade value from taking Xenophile uh, or Fanatic Xenophile, that is. So that's huge. That's that's even further boosting that. And then I think one of these gives us increased worker pop resource output. Now, your workers are your your lowest tier of of employees, right? It's those brown units that work to generate energy or generate minerals or, you know, all those all those kind of base level resources. Remember, your specialists are the the people that are working for technology. They're working on creating alloys. They're typically, I think, also your soldiers and your and your um, the people that are building your defensive armies. So so that is why on the ethics tree, these things are opposite from each other. Authoritarian gives you monthly influence and worker pop resource output, but egalitarian gives you an increase in your specialist pop output. And that's the same reason too, why you can't choose both. These are opposites of each other. So you can't take both. You won't be able to get your pop resource out, worker resource output and specialist resource output in the exact same run on the exact same faction. So make those choices as well. And then of course you go into the civics and you're going to have things like anglers here. This is from a, uh, from a DLC from the aquatics DLC. This gives you even more trade value from different things. So you can get additional trade value that, that uh, benefits off of your ethics. Or I think there's a couple more in here that benefit the production of energy, or at least maybe reduce the amount of energy that you spend on things. There is one here for, for minerals, of course. I think there may be one. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. But look through these, and, and if you're going the min-maxing route, you should, in my opinion, choose something to do very, 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 very well. And just do that thing if that's technology, if that's producing energy or minerals or food, and then see how you can use that to, to further the, uh, the strength of your empire by focusing on that strength specifically. Now, there's one last type of playthrough that you might wanna do. And this one I'll put in like, I'll call it the miscellaneous playthrough because there's a bunch of different things you can do with it, but that's if you just wanna do random traits and random civics and just see what works and 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 give it a go try some crazy stuff that you've never put together and try that the other way of doing it is a challenge run where you say hey i'm going to play something completely different than what i'm used to playing i'm gonna take something that's just so different than what's normal or what's in the meta of the game and give that a go to challenge myself to see if i can win the game that is definitely a way of playing. I've played a couple of those on stream on Twitch before, and they're very challenging, but also super rewarding if you can find out a cool combination of things that maybe you had never given yourself the chance to explore before. All right, I got this one a ton, which was what is the difference between the thick blue border and the thin white border in your empire? And this is another one of those, you know, not super necessary, it doesn't have a massive impact, but it can actually play a large role in certain circumstances for your empire. You'll notice that around our empire in this game, we've got a big, thick, purple, thick with two Cs, purple border around our empire here. And then on the inside, we've got these white borders that are super thin and they seem to be sort of random, but they're actually not. So the thick border around the empire is our entire empire ownership, right? And you'll see this around every single empire in the game. Uh, you'll This just denotes how much space you own, where are your systems, where are they located? The white border, however, is what's called a sector. And a sector is built around a sector capital. Now, at the beginning of the game, no matter who you start as, you will always have one sector pre-built for you around your capital planet. And that's uh, Sutharia for us. And that sector extends four systems out from our capital planet. Now that's by default, but sectors are always four systems wide. And once you've extended past four systems, you'll notice in the northern region here, that sector border no longer exists. Now, why is that? Like, what, what do you have to do to get it? Well, you actually have to click on a planet or a habitat that you own and you've got to choose, and I've already done this, but you've got to choose create new sector. I can actually show you what that might look like here on this planet. If I were to create Canadrius and turn it into a sector capital, 
it would create a sector, uh, let's just do it, of four systems wide around it. Now, that's a pretty small sector compared to our capital sector. You'll notice our capital sector is much larger. What's the benefit of that? Well, a sector kind of uh, encapsulates all of the planets and systems within that four system wide area. And it allows you to elect a governor to that system. A governor is a leader just like your scientists or admirals or your generals. And governors, just like the other, uh, the other leaders, have their own traits. So a governor, for instance, can re uh, increase the amount of food from jobs of all of the planets and all of the systems in that sector. That, that could be huge if you've got a big sector with a lot of food. You've got ones, I, I have ones here that I elected pretty early in my game because I I took over a hive mind and our entire empire fell into crime and, and uh, disruption and they all tried to rebel against me. Well, I turned that area into a sector and I added an, um, uh, a governor that had righteousness, which, or righteous, which reduces their crime by 25, 25, which is awesome for those kind of uprising situations where you can't quite keep things under control until you've built the right buildings to crack down on crime. Now, you can always manage your sectors in the planets and sectors uh, section on the left menu here. And this allows you, if, for instance, you made a mistake, like with Canadrius Prime, to delete a sector if you'd like to, and then you can always recreate it. Once a sector has been built, it will expand out from that sector capital, so you've got to be kind of smart about how you build them. Here's a really great tip for you if you're curious about how to make the most of your sectors. I had these two brand new planets, Canadrius Prime and Hoshphere Prime, but they're about nine spaces or nine jumps away from each other. So they couldn't be held in the same sector, which is kind of unfortunate because I don't want to build a thousand sectors, right? I would love to have a small number of sectors, uh, but have a bunch of planets within them. We'll save on the cost of governors. We'll save on just my own mental processing. So what I did is I looked at Hoshphere and Canadrius. I counted one, two, three, four sectors away, or sorry, four systems away. And this one, one, two, three, four systems away. I knew that if I had a planet somewhere between these two systems here, I could build a sector that encompasses all of the planets and all of that space. And I did that by actually creating a habitat, an artificial planet on this planet here. And this artificial planet is going to become our sector capital in the future once I actually finally colonize it. And its sector is going to encompass one, two, three, and because I'm such a stickler for this, four, the last two little ends at the end here, right? And it's also going to encompass one, two, three, four, and Hoshphere. It is the perfect size sector for the amount of space that we have. Now, it can't dip down any any more into this sector here, unless I were to delete this, create this one, and then recreate our original sector. Whichever one is the original sector will expand out and the sectors won't be able to expand into other sectors at that point. So keep that in mind as you're building them. You can get into some funky shapes when you're building them, but that is the difference between the thick border that we have around the outside and the thin white borders on the inside of our empire. All right, somebody brought up the question, I have trouble keeping up with the early to mid game technologies. Do I have to pair researchers with specific techs? And my answer for this is not really. I mean, it's ideal again, like anything like sectors and um, and like all these things like choosing governors for the right role. It's beneficial to do it. It's a small benefit, but it's not super necessary. It is better to have a scientist in a role doing something than it is to have the perfect scientist in a role doing that thing, right? So if we look at our our scientist options right here, you'll notice that we don't have a, a physics researcher, maybe that specifically researches computing. We have them employed, but we don't have them in the, in the list here. If our physics researcher were to die, right, I would happily grab Tetrana here because she's got Spark of Genius, one of the best perks for any scientist that is doing either physics, society, or engineering research. That does not apply to your scientists on science ships. So don't don't grab Spark of Genius and put on a science vessel unless maybe this is the best option. 
for that science vessel. In fact, in this case, I would say it is the best option for a science vessel out of these three if I had to choose one right now. I don't tend to cycle these like other players do because the cost of purchasing them is in Unity, and Unity has become an incredibly valuable resource now in the most recent update of the game. So I would say if I were purchasing, if I had to put somebody on a science vessel, I'd grab Tetrana. If I had to put somebody on physics research, I would definitely grab Tetrana. She's awesome. But if I were trying to fill, let's say, uh, an engineering uh, scientist, and I was specifically looking for ships, right? Just because Vetas or Veltas has the expertise in materials doesn't mean he's a bad engineer researcher, right? I would definitely choose Tetrana over Veltas in this case, just because I think this really, really uh, trumps any of these choices, but it's better to have a scientist in a seat than it is to go without a scientist for months uh, or certainly years. Make sure you fill those seats as soon as possible. Every second you aren't researching, you are losing time against the other opponents in the galaxy. Now, here was a great question that I've been asked a couple times, and I think many of you want to see a Let's Play or a full playthrough of the game because of it. If that's you, we actually stream on Twitch three days a week. We don't always stream Solaris, but we're often back in the directory, especially when there's a new update. So go check it out. It's twitch.tv slash Max the Catfish, and you can support myself there as well through subscribing or through bits. Uh, it's just a way of, of hanging out with the community and watching gameplay live and getting your answers, quest your questions answered. There we go. Live as we typically do. But there was a question, how do I win a game of Stellaris? And this is a really good one because I don't think it's very apparent to new players how it even, like, what's the point? Like, what's the point of playing the game? Personally, I think the point of playing the game is to enjoy it, right? Enjoy your playthrough. It doesn't always have to be a victory. It's actually sometimes fun to fail. But if you really want to win a game of Solaris, you should take a look at the situation log, go down to the tab called Victory. This tab shows you where you rank compared to the other empires in the game. Now you'll notice, I think I'm playing the Tekronauts. I am not first, right? I've got 70,000 points. I'm gonna have to beat at least 16,000, which is doable in a game of Solaris, very doable. But these points are earned from various things. They're earned from your economic strength. How good of an economy have you built throughout the game? How great of an empire overall have you built throughout history is really what this is looking at. Now that includes stuff like, do you have vassals? Those are your subject empires. Are you in a federation and how strong and prosperous is that federation? Have you participated in the mid game and the end game crisis? Or have you left it up to other empires to take care of them for you. Around 2400 or so, 2350, sometimes 2300, sometimes, you will encounter the mid-game crisis. And this is a big attack on your galaxy, on your universe. It's not necessarily against you. It might even be completely handled by the AI in your game, but they will incur some some faction will will break into the galaxy and try to take over and you have to fight back against them. It might be that the end game crises spawned halfway across the galaxy from you or especially the mid game crisis can can do this and gets handled by the other NPCs and not you. You're not going to get any credit for for participating in that. And thus you have to make up for that by proving that you spent those years successfully by building your economy up by you know specializing your planets and making them super strong and super profitable those are the kind of trade-offs that you have to make in the game now the end game crisis is much more difficult i don't think i've ever seen an end game crisis get beat by the ai themselves typically the end game crisis kind of corners specific enemies of yours and destroys them and then moves on to the next one and destroys them and moves on to the next one. So usually this one is up to you to defeat. Now you can play this in a couple of different ways too. Probably not ideal is to let the end game crisis just destroy everybody and then come after you. You probably should go on the offensive a little bit sooner than that. But after you've defeated and contained the end game crisis, as long as year 2500 or whatever you have the end year in your game set is the game ends and the person with the most victory points in the victory 
screen wins. So keep that in mind. Those points in that screen are how you win a game of Stellaris. I have not gotten to an end of a game of Stellaris in recent days without being the victor. And that might be surprising because at 2300, about one third in the game, we have l way less than even the Awakened or the, the uh, larger empires that exist. Eventually, your scaling in the game really ramps up. Your fleets get bigger, your empire gets larger, you win a couple of wars or you absorb a couple of vassals and your score will dwarf the others. Maybe not your first game, maybe not your 10th game, maybe not your 50th game, but eventually as you get a hang of the concepts and if you're playing at the difficulty that's appropriate for your, you know, your level of play, you can definitely exceed this. So this is something that I think a lot of players come to come to this screen and they go, oh, there's no way I could beat the Shabtak Remnant. Like they're, they're so much more powerful. How am I going to get, what is this, five times the, the power, more than five times the power of them? It will happen. It just takes a little bit of ramping up to and scaling up to it. The easiest way to do this, of course, is by conquering your opponents and taking their space. You'll get massive boosts to your economic strength. You'll get massive boosts to your number of systems and colonies and pops. Those numbers are probably the core of this, but you can win in other ways, especially if you want to play a pacifist empire. Give it a try. There's a whole bunch of different ways to play and to win and just experiment with it and find the gameplay style that you enjoy the most. That's the most important part. Now, I get this question probably more than any other, which is how many systems should I claim? Should I stay small? Should I care about Empire Sprawl? These are big, important questions. And really, I think the biggest question here is what kind of play do you want to experience? And there's uh, so many in Solaris, that's why I ask, right? There is this concept of wide versus tall. If you want to build wide versus tall, if you can imagine your space in your empire, I've built probably in the middle of these two. I haven't gone super wide. I haven't gone super tall, right? But wide, imagine you take a ton of systems. You conquer your opponents. You go to war often and you take a lot of space. The wider you go, the larger your empire sprawl will be, or your empire size will be, as they call it now. And that has an effect on the adoption of new traditions. It ha actually increases the cost of gaining new traditions, and it has an effect on your technology costs. If you go too wide too quickly, your technology gain will slow down. That is the balancing act that Stellaris puts in place to prevent people from just only doing war and war being the only answer, right? Taking space being the only answer. Similarly, if you build super small, super tight, keep a small number of systems and planets in a small amount of, of systems, that's called building tall. Your planets are much, much more powerful. They're much more capable individually. They often have many, many, many more pops on them than a wide sprawling empire would. And your technology cost and your adoption for traditions cost is much lower compared to your opponents. So you might have a smaller number of ships, let's say, but those ships are more technologically advanced. Now, I think the community in Solaris would say, the more ships and firepower you have, the better. It doesn't matter about the tech. If you can overwhelm your opponent with a death sack, you're going to win. I think that actually does ring pretty true. And building wide is the pretty de facto typical play style, but that doesn't mean that you have to be an aggressor all the time. It doesn't mean you have to take every single system. You'll notice that in our space, I've actually been very careful not to take certain systems because they're just kind of worthless. You know, look at Tedis here, right? Tedis would require us, if I can just right click on this, it would require 90 alloys and 75 of my 340 influence to take. And all I would get for it is three energy credits and two trade value. That's not a lot. And not only that, but it would increase the cost of my future technology costs and my future adoption of traditions. That's kind of a crappy trade, right? That's that's not really fair. 
um, that tradition might be, or sorry, influence might be better used to make claims on my northern opponent up here. I want to take Beetlejuice and uh, Rigot. And in fact, I have so much extra influence, I could grab a whole bunch more and start, you know, making an incursion in their space. I'm going to grab these claims because I want them. That is the decision that you have to make, right? Is it more important for you to keep your influence for claims or is it more important for you to take a system with only two physics research? Like why do it? Now there are some decisions here that you might wanna make. You'll notice that I've expanded actually pretty wide and that's because I had a lot of opportunities for archeological sites. I'm playing with the Ancient Relics DLC, which adds those. And I wanna grab those archeological sites because the only way to dig them up is if you own the system. So I expanded my empire out this way. I expanded my empire out this way to the north because I wanted a position that was going to be strategically defensive against a really aggressive and hateful northern neighbor. They are an isolationist. They are a fanatic spiritualist and xenophobe, the exact opposite of my ethics. And so I wanted to make sure that I had grabbed Kachada and eventually Howling Vortex, which I won in a war. And those would be much stronger defensive positions for me against possible attacks. That's a big reason to expand, is to grab strategic locations. You'll notice I haven't really expanded into this emptiness down here, and it's because we have a whole bunch of, of neutral, aggressive mining drones, and I think these are shardlings down here, that are preventing my southern friend, they're kind of an ally, from expanding in this direction. I don't have to take all this. Not right now, maybe not ever, I'm not sure. There is a archeological site here that I'd love to grab. It would require me killing one of the mining drones to do, which would be relatively easy. I just haven't done it yet. So those are the decisions when it comes to expanding your empire and taking a bunch of systems. It's going to have an effect on your tech cost. It will have an effect on your tradition adoption. But the trade-off might be that you get a really important archeological site. You unearth a relic that, you know, uh, works towards your victory score. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to expand. In fact, here, you might want to expand here to grab that wormhole and defend it against possible attacks. Who knows where that leads? Similarly, I think I have one down here. I was grabbed by them. That that leads up to my opponent. So I probably want... Oh, that is my opponent. We're going to get on that. Don't worry. Uh, my opponent has actually has actually come through this wormhole. I wish that I had prevented this by expanding towards that wormhole and grabbing all of this space first. That's a lot of space to grab, and it would have had a big effect on our tech cost, which is kind of the focus of this build. So I decided not to do it. Time will tell whether having an opponent being able to attack me from both sides of my empire was a good decision or a bad decision, right? Think about those things when, when you're choosing which systems to expand to. Similarly, there was a question about how should I spend or manage influence? Should I take every single system or save my influence for other purposes? This ties into some of the other concepts in the game, which you may have access to if you have the DLC. You may have limited access to if you don't have the DLC. Remember a couple of things. When you're engaging in diplomacy with another empire, that diplomacy typically has a cost. If I form a non-aggression pact with the, who are these guys? The He Jam. It actually costs me influence per month to have a non-aggression pact. This is a beneficial thing, right? We know that we can't attack each other without breaking this. And so there's an effect on your ability to expand your empire because of it. You're going to have to weigh whether 0.12 influence per month is worth a non-aggression pact with somebody who is pathetic in fleet power to you. Probably not. What are they going to do? They can't squash us. I broke my non-aggression pact with them because I didn't need to waste the influence on that. Now, conversely, I have somebody on the other side of the galaxy, the Kazam. And while they have pathetic fleet power, they're actually equivalent in technology and economy power. I just had a big boost of fleet power for my northern war that I was waging. And this is a pretty strong and important non-aggression pact for me to hold. They might have a wormhole that goes, in fact, this wormhole might even connect to the one that's just outside my territory. Having a non-aggression pact with somebody across the galaxy is typically rare, unless you think there's a possibility that they might completely overwhelm you. I've gotten myself in a pretty strong position with this, uh, with this nation 
also because they are the most powerful or they have the most sway in the galactic community. Now, if you have the, where did this come from? What's the DLC? Remind me of the DLC in the comments. Some, it's going to be like the most commented thing here. If you have the DLC that unlocks the full potential of the galactic community, preserving your influence to put forth resolutions is really important. Resolutions in the galactic community have a galactic effect on everybody that's part of the community there. You can see the ones that have come into effect here. Our diplomatic weight from economy is increased by 20%. So I am focusing on having a strong economy so that my diplomatic weight can increase. And my diplomatic weight puts me at the top of the galactic council. It means that I'm elected to the council as long as I'm within the top three or two or one empires in the game. This is one of those DLC benefits that is actually really fun to play with. It has some big overarching decisions in a game. I don't think it's the best one if you're just playing against AI. I think it's better if you're playing in a multiplayer setting because the AI sort of just votes for everything. They go, yeah, why not? We'll take it. Military Readiness Act, even though I have no military, give it to me. Sounds great. So you might not necessarily go for this as one of your first DLCs, but if you want to put forth a resolution in the galactic community, if you're able to do this, that costs influence. Putting forth the Charter of Worker Rights would have cost 100 influence, and I have to choose whether I spend the influence on expanding my empire or on an important resolution in the galactic community. Keep that in mind when you're choosing how much to spend and how much to keep in reserve as you play the game. So I had a couple of questions about empire defense and whether you should go on the offense against a potentially aggressive empire early rather than later and where to place your star bases. So a couple of things on this. I was lucky that I started next to the Hejam theocracy. Oh, well, they didn't used to be a theocracy. They actually used to be materialist and xenophilic, which is beautiful. That's exactly what you want when you're also playing a materialist and relative. I think we were egalitarian empire. I knew that these were going to be a pretty long term positive people. They weren't going to aggress on us. They weren't going to attack us very early. And so I had the freedom to sort of sit back and relax. Now, in the early game, I had a massive uprising against my empire. And when that uprising happened, all of the empires that I had previously met had a casus belly against me to subjugate me. My entire economy was cut in half, my fleets were destroyed, and I was in a very vulnerable position where they could come in and aggress on me. I was lucky that I had at a choke point a, uh, a star hold, I think at the point, uh, it's probably a star base just upgraded one time with a little bit of a defensive position, even though my ally next to me or my neighbor next to me was friendly. I typically put this at choke points whether I am next to a friendly empire or not. And that's because you never know what could happen. You could have your empire split in half because of an uprising and that previously friendly empire goes, huh, I could make a lot of space bucks by, uh, by taking these guys over. But having a little bit of a defensive position there proactively can really help. Behind it, I had also built a, uh, a small shipyard. And this was to make sure that if this were to happen, I can always reinforce my, my front with new ships. I tend to expand my star bases forward onto the front line as that front line shifts and changes. It typically happens when you take over a new empire, you take space from them. Up north, I had won a war and this was actually their star base or their citadel. And I grabbed that from them. I now own the citadel that they had built here. This is a great forward position for me to defend and make sure that I use this as my new staging position for wars against them. I would recommend that you build star bases in, uh, in choke points. I would recommend you build star bases in points where it's a pivotal connection for your empire. You'll notice there's one lane here that enters into my capital. And then there's a lane that enters into this sub portion of space with three planets. And there's a lane that continues out into the rest of space. 
And this position here at Torah is really powerful. It's a place that I have built up with a bunch of defenses to make sure that if anybody were to come this way, they would really have to give a fight to continue on to the next section of my of my empire or the next section or the most important where my capital is, right? Similarly, I make, and I've talked about this in the tutorial series, I made a couple of locations where are, which are specifically for trade. So Baldan is one of my strongest trade areas. If I take a look at trade routes, it is collecting 104 trade value. And that's because I've built this into a citadel that has six trade hubs, which allow it to collect trade up to six uh, jumps away. If we take a look and hold alt key, you can see your collected trade. We've got two and one here. If I build here, eventually in the future, maybe I'll get three here. All of that is going to the trade location station here. And then six away from this, I haven't done this yet in this gameplay, but one, two, three, four, five, six is my previous capital. It also has a trade station here. This is collecting four away. So there's some overlap with Baldon, but it's also collecting four south of it. So one, two, three, four. It would be better for me to relocate this once I take this portion of space to relocate it further south so that they, the two stations aren't collecting trade overlap, right? But they're both sending that to our new capital, which is located in Evon. And I want to touch on this a little bit because I learned some lessons while I was playing today and setting up for today's FAQ. I previously started space in this system, Suth Kasa, and this is my capital planet. But you'll notice that it's no longer a capital world. And that's because at a certain point, it's more advantageous for you to move your capital. Your capital planet, ours, which is now located here, Avanda Zun gives you a bunch of bonuses for being the capital. It gives you stability and amenities. It gives you governing ethics attraction for the population that live there. Relocating this, it gives you a massive re uh, increase from resources from jobs. Relocating this occasionally will allow you to specialize planets like our uh, Sutharia here into a tech world and then create a new capital somewhere else. The only benefit of this is that I can turn Sutharia into a tech world and get a much, much bigger benefit there than I was getting having it as our empire capital. Okay, so I moved our capital. Two things that are important about this. The first is I would highly recommend you build a upgraded star base before you move your capital, because all of the trade in your empire has to reach your capital system. And it can only reach a capital system if that system has an upgraded starbase. I did not know that. So what I did was I said, okay, I'm gonna go into, I'll show you as an example. I'm gonna go into here. I'm gonna click this button, move capital. And I press the button. And all of a sudden my entire economy broke down and I couldn't figure out what had happened. Like what, I don't, I don't understand. It must be trade. So I go into my main trade station. I went into the trade routes and this trade route is required to go from one station that's upgraded to another station that's been upgraded. So make sure you upgrade your station first. The second thing that happened was that new capital is typically going to be part of a new uh, of a new sector. And so as you're moving your capital around, think about where is the center of my next sector going to be? A sector capital is typically an empire capital. So I wanted to take all of the systems and all of the planets here in this region and bind them into a sector. That's why I chose Avon because it would go one, two, and down here it would go one, two, three, and bind that sector into its own little thing there. All right, I think that's many of the most requested questions, except for the most requested. Which DLC I think are worth getting and in which order? Absolutely. That's going to be our next video in the series for Stellaris. I'm going to talk through which DLC are good, which DLC are eh, a little less good, which DLC are for more advanced players that have just maybe played the game out and are looking for more content, and which I think are the most important DLC for everyone to own. Can't wait to share that with you. That'll be in our next video. But until then, if you haven't done so already, you should check us out on Twitch. We're on twitch.tv slash Max the Catfish. We stream three days a week. You can check out the schedule over on Twitch there. And we are playing games like Stellaris. I've actually recently gotten into Total War Warhammer 3, which is a grand strategy game that I am sort of 
obsessed with. It's so much fun, but we play a bunch of different thinky big games like this. And there you get to talk with our wonderful community and our community of people. It's a really cool place. So whether it's on Twitch or YouTube, I will see you next time. See you soon.